In order to understand the mind, we've opened our minds to see what hasn't been glimpsed, 
to break through into new levels of discovery, we ask questions that drive research today so that it may become the cures of tomorrow. We are explorers who delve into the most complex structure known to man so that our most challenging questions can be solved. And admitted to discover the treatments that turn mental illness into mental health. We envision a day when Alzheimer's is a distant memory. When autism is just another human variation. When depression is overcome, addictions are released, and a paradigm shift in beliefs erases the pain of stigma. We are at the forefront of grasping the biology of genius and creativity, and the complex links between the mind and body. Bringing together extraordinary minds across disciplines, interacting to find the answers that can heal our most human challenges. And training the next generation to go even further. This is the center of a revolution in neuroscience. Here, we strive to open our minds even further. Because we must. Good evening, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed our video presentation about the world-renowned Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior, where over 300 clinicians and researchers work collaborative collaboratively to develop new treatments for illnesses of the mind and brain that affect roughly 46 million people in this country every year and where new discoveries in neuroscience are made. My name is Vicki Goodman, and on behalf of the Friends of the Semmel Institute, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Open Mind presentation. Yesterday began Mental Health Awareness Week, and I can't think of a better way to commemorate this week than by welcoming psychiatrist Peabody Award-winning uh, filmmaker and renowned author, Dr. Kenneth Paul Rosenberg. <laughs> Dr. Rosenberg has come from New York to be here this evening to talk to us about his new book that was just released, Bedlam, An Intimate Look at America's Mental Health Crisis, and to show clips from the documentary, which premiered at Sundance this year, to rave reviews and a standing ovation. We are so thrilled to have Dr. Rosenberg here this evening. He's going to talk to us about um, the mental illness and homelessness crisis here in Los Angeles, which if you saw the Los Angeles Times this morning was on the front page. Um, and we're also, we are so fortunate to get to see clips of the film because it's not coming out until April of 2020. So how lucky are we? Um, in addition to being a Peabody, yes. In addition to being a Peabody award-winning documentary filmmaker of six films for HBO and three films for PBS, and the author of Bedlam and Infidelity, Why Men and Women Cheat, Dr. Rosenberg is a practicing psychiatrist in New York 
who specializes in addiction, infidelity, and sexual compulsive disorder. He is also a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at the Weill Cornell Medical College and New York Presbyterian Hospital. He is what I refer to as psychiatry royalty. Following Dr. Rosenberg's presentation, he will be joined by more psychiatry royalty. Um, we have with us this evening Dr. Peter Weibrow, who is the director of the Semmel Institute and chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences here at the Semmel Institute. Dr. Weibrow will be moderating this evening's discussion. Dr. Jonathan Sharon, who I know is handling a crisis this evening, but he will be with us here later. He is the director of the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health since he's been the director since 2016. Also with us this evening are two psychiatrists who appear in the film Bedlam, Dr. Lashar McGee, who is a public psychiatrist who works with vulnerable populations with severe behavioral and medical illness compounded by socio socioeconomic conditions and Dr. Colin Dias, chief of former chief of psychiatry at the LA County USC Medical Center and uh, former interim chief of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at that other campus in Los Angeles. <laughs> you all know what it is, so I don't have to say it. I know there are a few of you out there, too, that are affiliated with that other campus, but, um, USC. <laughs> And also with us this evening to participate in this discussion from UCLA is Dr. Philippe Bourgeois, who is a professor and director of the Ethno, well, you know what, I'm going to let him introduce his title. <laughs> um, you will meet all of these uh, discussions after Dr. Rosenberg's talk. Um, just a few words for those of you who are here for the first time this evening. This evening's program is part of our Open Mind Community Lecture and Film Series that brings together filmmakers, authors, neuroscientists, mental health professionals to present programs about mental health issues and the mysteries of the mind and brain. And we're able to bring these programs free to the public because of the generos generosity of audience members like you. Um, if you have not yet joined the Open Mind, think public television, public radio. If you feel these programs benefit the community, we hope that you will join us in support of the Open Mind. You can do so by picking up an envelope on your way out this evening, or visit our website, friendsofthesemmelinstitute.org, where you'll also find a calendar of our upcoming very exciting Open Mind programs. And we hope to see all of you at future Open Mind events. Um, we're also on Facebook, Twitter. We're now also on Instagram, which is a learning curve for me, but I'm trying my very best. Um, so please follow us on all those sites. Um, couple of housekeeping things. Uh, please be sure your cell phones are either in silent mode or turned off. Um, questions will be, uh, we will have Q&A after the discussion. If you could please write your questions down on the index cards that you received on your way in this evening. If you didn't get a card, we will pass some more out. And following that, you will have an opportunity to purchase a copy of Bedlam signed by Dr. Rosenberg, and I believe that People Magazine just named it uh, the best book of the week when it debuted last week. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Kenneth Paul Rosenberg. Thank you so much. That's such a beautiful introduction. Thank you, Vicki. Um, I want to thank the Semmel Institute, thank Wendy, the entire staff, for this really incredible opportunity to come back to a place where I began my residency at UCLA when it was NPI uh, in the 80s. So it was really just full circle and quite emotional and wonderful for me to be here. 
So in this project, I thought I'll film in a busy ER, the, one of the busiest, if not the busiest in the country, and I'll film for a week or maybe a month, and then I'll be done with my film. And that was seven years ago, and we're still finishing the editing of the film. Um, I had no idea it would take so long, and one of the reasons it took so long is because I, I wanted to make a film with the patients, that it really collaborated with the patients and the families, not just about them. And I also wanted to make a film that really involved my own life, which I decided at some point I really needed to do. I had absolutely no idea that I would do this, but I felt that it was really the important thing to talk about my own family and my own sister's serious mental illness, which I rarely spoke about, even as a resident. Um, a lot of that is in the book, and with your kind indulgence, I'm going to read a little bit from the book and then show 37 minutes from the film. I would love to show you the entire film. I hope to come back here at some point and show you the 90-minute film. But uh, right now, we'll have to settle for 37 minutes of the clips. So I'm going to start with page one. I guess that's a good place to start, how it all began. It had been two weeks since I'd spoken to Merrill, and I was afraid. For months, i have been calling my sister every few days, cajoling, threatening, using every carrot and stick I could to convince her to move to a facility that could care for her, where she might make friends for the first time in decades. Finally, she stopped answering the phone. Now 55 years old, she had been living on her own for the first time since my mother died two years earlier. On December 27, 2005, after 14 days of silence, I rode the Metro North train home from work in Manhattan, focused on the task ahead. As an addiction psychiatrist, I spent the day treating people with depression, anxiety, drug and alcohol problems. Over the years, I've received many notes of thanks from patients for saving their lives from the various addictions. But it had been years since I treated someone for schizophrenia. I lived a comfortable life, commuting between my Upper East Side office and a bedroom community in Scarsdale. The loving and stable home that I'd created with my wife and two children offered a complete departure from my chaotic childhood in Philadelphia. Now, the chaos was creeping back. Despite all my psychiatric training and practice, I was at a loss for what to do about my sister. It was not unusual for Merrill to avoid me. In the two years since my mother's death, I had often called the emergency operator, then there were emergency operators, who would report that the phone was off the hook. Call the police, they would suggest, no police, I thought. My sister would call me when she was ready. But this time was different. The phone was on the receiver. In the last ditch effort to avoid the unavoidable, I reached out to Gail's widower, my brother-in-law Bob, who lived nearby, to ask him to knock on the door. No answer. Mail was piled on the doorstep. It was time to make the call. So that's how the book begins. And that's somewhat how the film begins. Um, there's so many people to thank for this project. All projects like this are collaborations with many people. But I first must thank ITVS, PBS for supporting me, the MacArthur Foundation for supporting me, my camera crew, Alan Barker, Joan Churchill, Buddy Squires, and Bob Rich, and Michael Donaldson as well, and also my daughter, Claire, who said, if you're going to make a film about this topic, you need to go to the epicenter of the crisis, and that's Los Angeles. So let's watch 37 minutes of Bedlam. Mental hospitals like the one my sister was taken to were far from ideal, but they provided necessary care. In the 1950s, there were 558,000 patients in America's asylums. By the time I finished my training as a psychiatrist, 40 years later, over nine... I'm quitting because it's a workload that's not manageable. My responsibility has to be to being the best doctor I can be. So I sort of developed a way to cope. 
it's just gone on too long. As long as doctors tolerate these working conditions and the outside world won't know what's going on or understand what's going on, then nothing will ever get better. The definition of insanity is repeating the same thing over and over and expecting different results. The way we treat mentally ill in this country is insane. To not have access to regular food, housing, medication, medical care, it doesn't make for a good American story. Dr. Rosenberg for making this film and for sharing this story with all of us and with the whoops with the public um, who will get to see it when it's on television. This I think Dr. McGee said it perfectly. This is not a good American story. Um, and um, well, we're very grateful to Dr. Rosenberg. Come on up. Um, I, I'd like to introduce all of our discussants this evening. Um, as I said, we have psychiatry royalty with us tonight. Dr. Peter Wybrow, the director of the Semmel Institute. He is the Judson Braun, Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at UCLA, also the Physician-in-Chief of the Stewart and Linda Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital at UCLA, and the Executive Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at the David Geffen School of Medicine here at UCLA. He's also, also the author of numerous best-selling books, including A Mood Apart, the Well-Tuned Brain, and American Mania, and I'm proud to say that we've featured a few of Dr. Wybrow's books at our Open Mind events. Welcome, Dr. Wybrow. Dr. Wybrow will be moderating the discussion. Also with us this evening is Dr. Jonathan Sharon, who is the director of the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health. He has been that, was the, appointed by the Los Angeles County Supervisors in 2016. In this role, he leads the largest public mental health system in the country, serving over 250,000 clients annually in the most populous and one of the most eth ethnically diverse counties in the nation. Prior to that, Dr. Sharon served as both the medical director and executive vice president of military communities for Volunteers of America. He is a psychiatrist and a neurobiologist. Please welcome Dr. Jonathan Sharon. And you all met Dr. Lashar McGee, who uh, was at the LA County um, uh, USC Hospital in the uh, emergency psychiatry. She's now at um, all of you mental health, all of you hospital, and is a public psychiatrist who specializes in the systems-based practice and management of vulnerable populations with severe behavioral and medical issues. Welcome, Dr. McGee. 
And also, you met briefly in the film Dr. Colin Dias, who is the president, CEO, and founder of CPD Collaborative. He's the former chief of psychiatrist in the LA County USC Medical Center and uh, former interim chief of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry there. And Dr. Philippe Bourgeois, who Dr. Wybrow will help me with his titles. Um, welcome, everybody. Please come up and take a seat. Thank you very much, everybody, for your interest. This is a, an amazing blockbuster film, just extraordinary. You to be congratulated, Dr. Horizon, but this is amazing. And I think uh, it will have extraordinary impact. But you know, this has been going on for a long, long time. Uh, not only in America, in lots of other places, but we are far, far behind now. I, when I was a high school student, I worked in a mental hospital in England. That was in the late 50s. And there, we had only peraldehyde, which some of you may know about, which is a s sicky substance that looks a bit like you know, alcohol, very tense, dense alcohol. It smells terribly. That was the only treatment we had for people who had severe mental illness. So the people you saw tonight, when they're completely out of control, the only thing that we could do would be to give them this peraldehyde. They go to sleep, next morning they wake. Times have changed in what we know. We know so much more, but you can see that it's that sort of prevailing system is still in place. Now you have to ask yourself, why is that? We are probably the richest country in the world, or very close to it, depending on how you calculate that. But we still have this terrible scourge here. This is, this is a shame upon all of us. So thank you for the film. Thank you. It's extraordinary what you've achieved. I think uh, we have on the panel some amazing people. You've met two of them in the film already. Uh, I'll just say briefly about, uh, as I was asked, about uh, um, Philippe Bourgois, who came to us from the University of Pennsylvania about uh, two years ago. He's an extraordinarily well-known anthropologist and social scientist. He directs in the Institute the Center for Social Medicine and Humanities and works, as he will tell you as we go forward, in the county system and uh, particularly knows the jail from the inside, doing quite a lot of work there. The other person I want to highlight is John Sharon. John Sharon actually, we're proud to say, is a graduate of the programs here, the, the postgraduate programs. An extraordinary man who has taken on this, ex this extremely difficult problem of trying to figure out how you can bring a social system back into the care of the mentally ill. See, it's not at the end game. It's not the end game where the persons are disturbed and caught and trapped by police or by the circumstances they find themselves in. If you've ever been down to the center of the city, you'll be terrified, and they live in that terrifying situation. John has tried to say, this is a systems problem. We've got to start from the scratch and figure out so that Dr. McGee and others don't have to do what they have to do and what you saw in this film. So we owe a lot to all these people. I'm gonna shut up and let them speak for themselves. But this is a true public health crisis which includes the whole of our nation. It's not just the end game. Think of that. We've gotta think of ways in which these people never get to these points of being on the streets, yes? never get to the points where their illness is at totally out of control, where they're taking street drugs and they're living on the corner. So let's think about that as we go forward for the evening. And let me start by just uh, having another word from what really motivated you to wait, because you must be a very patient man. 
You could have made this film in many different ways, but you chose to make it in the way in which you laced things together in an extraordinary fashion. Thank you so much. Again, it's an honor to be here, and I started at UCLA in my residency, so how magnificent to be back here. Uh, fortunately, I have a good day job. I'm a psychiatrist, so I could make films over the course of seven years and five years, and, and what I learned in medical school, you know, I started making films in medical school. I was, I, we, we spoke earlier, and I was saying when I was, uh, went to medical school, I was, I went to medical school to become a psychiatrist because of my sister's illness. And I was very, very bored with medical school because there wasn't as much psychiatry or really, for me, any psychiatry. So I started making films to kind of really contextualize and to show what patients' experiences were like. Because we would, as medical students, we would look on the screen, we'd see a doctor interviewing a patient, the doctor was usually a guy, the patient was in pajamas. It, you know, you really have a sense of who these people are. So I learned early on in medical school that the way to get a sense was to go to their home and to follow them over the course of time to sort of build the, the narrative about them. So the idea of following people over the course of time is you know what I did as soon as I made films when I was in medical school. I'm going to ask each to say a few words, and then there will be questions from the audience. And I think they, we are also playing the card game, which we very often do here, which is you write down your thoughts and bring it up, and we'll see what we can do in terms of covering most of them. But John, I want you to tell us a little bit about what it was that took you from your um, program in with veterans to this position which you now have and why indeed it's so important to you. You're a man of great passion, I know that, and you've, you've, you've made an extraordinary change already. But tell us about the, the, the way in which that frames up for you as a, as a physician. Uh, that's a big question. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is that uh, this is the fourth time I've caught a piece of this film. I saw it in the unedited version a while ago. And um, and then I saw it again in two other contexts, and then tonight, and it's probably getting more powerful for me. Thanks so much. Um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, Peter is referencing the the fact that actually I spent the bulk of my career in the VA. Um, I used to run mental health for the local uh, campus, and then also for the Miami healthcare system, and then I spent a lot of time in the nonprofit sector taking care of vets, and. Um, you know, vulnerable populations, populations who uh, need help um, are calling for certain people. And uh, I always, um, in certainly in my training here, uh, was attracted to taking care of the sickest people. Um, and I think that um, the, the people who are suffering um, and who really do not have the capacity um, without a lot of help to become independent um, and have identity and agency, and then to leverage that to connect with family, um, with their community and society, and, and, and to have an understanding of their belonging, you know, um, more broadly, spiritually, um, are, the, are the, the, the people that I think uh, continue to suffer the most. They're, they're marginalized, they're excluded from our communities, and it's only when we figure out how to resource our communities and create a culture in our communities that embraces and leverages all of our constituents that we will actually thrive more broadly. And I think we're in a particularly divisive time right now. And the fact that we have so much resource and yet uh, remain disconnected is very, very troubling. And I think that drives me at a very fundamental level every day to help move this system and all of the systems that it interacts with. Thank you. Um, the angel at the end. I mean, my goodness me, you were in, in, your, in, your, uh, in your normal behavior on the units, you were caught in a, in, a, in a way that I think is just extraordinary. And I want you to tell us a little bit about what goes on inside your head when you're standing there in front of that man who is terrified and belligerent and about to be crucified all at once. What, what happens to you when you see that? Um. And why you come out with that wonderful smile? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
You know, I'd, I'd like to say something profound, but usually in that situation, my goal is twofold. It's to connect as much as I can on a human level with whoever happens to be in front of me. Um, I couldn't do this job if I didn't do that. Uh, and then second is um, to give them the best care that I can in that moment. Uh, with somebody like that gentleman in the movie, it's, um, it's pretty rudimentary. It's, it, it, it unfortunately really, in that point, came down to safety. Um, but uh, I, anything I do in the emergency, I recognize the emergency room is about as inhumane as it gets. Um, and so my goal is to be as, as human as possible in every way that I possibly can um, to, to give myself um, to give to give the patient the grace and the space to be who they are, um, to meet them where they are, and to hopefully provide them the best care that I can in a pretty horrible circumstance. Well, you certainly do that beautifully. You must have recognized a very un unusual doctor when you were <laughs> working, uh, supervising that particular hospital that you worked at when you when the film was taken. T tell us a little bit about that, the kind of the hospital. Uh, sh she is amazing, and I'm glad that I hired her, and we were sorry to see her leave. Um, you know, all the county hospitals in Los Angeles really deal with the same demographic and the same population. And the most difficult thing, I think everyone up here can relate to administratively, is how do you run a department that provides services to this diverse population from the emergency rooms to the inpatient setting to kids and adults in the emergency room who are struggling with homelessness, substance abuse, and chronic mental illness in the context of chronic budget deficits? How do you motivate great psychiatrists like Lashar to stick with the LECUSC psyche ER to provide this outstanding level of clinical service when there aren't enough case managers to help her properly disposition these patients. And so this continuous battle and struggle um, ensues, and it's very demoralizing as a, as a mental health provider born and raised in Los Angeles um, and committed to this population, very demoralizing to feel like you're fighting an uphill battle um, so I'm glad that Ken approached us a number of years ago and is using this film and his personal experience with his sister and his family to really shine a light, not only on the mental health crisis, but I think to force us to shine a light on our own consciousness, and to be introspective and ask the question, what are our own individual biases against mental illness? And if we as educated professionals have biases, can you imagine our society at large and how do we begin collectively to tackle tackle these issues? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a round of too. Well, I said at the beginning, I think this was not this is not a um, this is not a one-off medical crisis. This is something that erodes the whole of our culture, and we can't really sit there and watch it without recognizing that it's a it's a great abscess within us. And anthropologists are particularly interesting people because they, they move back. It's as if the camera go goes back and they begin to look at the society which lies at the, uh, at the soft underbelly of the sort of thing that you can see at the top, which is what we were seeing tonight. Um, Philippe Bourgois is actually one of our nation's preeminent anthropologists who studied social systems for a long time. He's done a lot of work in Philadelphia. He did some work in South America. And he, we were able to bring him here in part because 
the, the crisis in Los Angeles needs the sort of mind that can spread it out and understand what is the social infrastructure which permits such things. So, Philippe, tell us a little bit, just a little bit about your, you, I know you, you know the jail and so on and so forth, but tell us a little bit about how you read this within the context of a broader social vision that you have of, of, of where we stand. Well, thank you, Peter. And first, I want to thank you for such, such a moving film. The clips that we saw were really very powerful. And as an anthropologist, I want to thank you for making such a powerful ethnographic document. Thank and you. And as you said, from, from the perspectives of the patients and the families, and, and, and that, was, that was fantastic, as well as, as the interlocutors trying to help them and, and, um, and their frustrations as well. Um, um, and I, I, um, in anthropology, we use this methodology of participant observation uh, ethnography, which in normal language is deep hanging out. Um, <laughs> and it's making fr friends with the people that you study and spending time with them in their daily environment and shadowing them to get their perspective. And um, through, the, through John Sharon's department, the Department of Mental Health has started up, uh, had started up a brand new pilot program, a, a, a fascinating program, an important one, um, in, in right at the same time that Peter recruited me to the department and, um, it, it, and had asked um, colleague, psychiatrist colleagues of mine, I'm an anthropologist, not a, not a psychiatrist, to do a quality improvement evaluation of this program. It's the emergency outpatient treatment program designed in some sense to stop people from entering into the chronic cycle of, of or to interrupt people who, who either have just entered it and, and are in the early stages of entering it or are about to enter it or have been in it too long. So it's, it's meant to serve the people in, 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 enter in terrible states of crisis with, with um, repeated rates of incarceration, uh, hospitalization, and, um, and, um, and, ho and chronic homelessness. And um, immediately um, um, what happened was we um, ran into, in a sense, the overdeveloped investment that has occurred. You show us so beautifully in the movie the tragedy of just the, the tearing down of the hospitals with no replacement. And tragically, we did replace it with something. We replaced it with the most massive buildup in history of jails and incarceration, the fastest rates uh, that, have, that, that are just completely unprecedented in human history. And the vic the, in a sense, the canary victims are the people who got swept up in that disproportionately people with, with serious mental illness, with, uh, with, with schizophrenia, spectrum diagnoses, with bipolar diagnoses, and, and even elderly people with dementia uh, are increasingly filling uh, twin towers now. It's, it's such a tragedy. Being arrested for trespassing on the houses that they were gentrified out of, but that they still think that they belong in. So let me take some of the questions that you have asked and just distribute, distribute them out a little bit. But I also want the panelists to feel completely free about interrupting each other and, and, and embellishing things and so on. So this becomes a little more animated than all of us sitting up here like uh, um, stuffed dolls and um, <laughs> hoping that we're uh, entertaining you. Um, <laughs> but let me just start with Dr. Sharon again um, because the question, John, is what is your opinion regarding the pervading uh, feeling, th the view within the county that it's the right of the mentally ill to refuse treatment? Um, and the fact that th this, in the writer's suggestion, is one way in which we have tended to distill down the people we treat in many institutions like the mental health clinics to persons who are not like the ones you've been seeing in the film, yes? So is it that we, in the, in the sense that civil rights have led us in some ways to the fact that these individuals who have no sense of their own civil right at certain points are in fact uh, warehoused in their own shabby areas of, of, of Los Angeles? Uh, that's a great question, Peter, and it's something that I've been engaged in very intensively since I took over this job and, and, and to this day, but I, I would like to give a plug to my five bosses, the 
supervisors of Los Angeles County who, with a great deal of, I would say, new information and thinking, uh, modified the policy about developing a 4,000 bed jail. And now we're in the process of trying to figure out how do we apply that resource to create a network of treatment around this county and build up um, many needed hospital beds, mental health beds, locked and unlocked beds um, for those with mental illness and also addictions. And I'm going to be filing a report on that very soon. And the numbers are astounding as to how with our shortage um, of beds is currently as far as involuntary treatment I will and I'll try to keep this short but I do spend a lot of time working on it um, yeah, LPS laws are about 50 years old and LPS law was really I think framed around the concept of living safely in community if you can't live safely in community because of a mental illness and you're unwilling to accept treatment then there is a rationale to compel treatment. Um, but that actually, I think, really kind of got lost in the shuffle. And that was a different time. Um, what we do now is um, we actually um, allow people who are sick to, um, to, to be in our communities, not living safely, I would say, to themselves and also to, to others in terms of creating public health and public safety issues. Um, and um, we relegate our responsibility as a clinical system that can't engage individuals to our police and to our jails as first responders, as engagers, and uh, for treatment. That is inhumane, it's inappropriate, and um, I think that this is a very, very tough conversation, and it's the autonomists versus the paternalists, and I've spent many times here locally and in Sacramento dodging flying objects, <laughs> but what I would say is that, number one, it is not humane to allow people to be uh, on the streets li languishing deteriorating, dying in the streets. We've had uh, over a thousand people die in the streets this year and that number continues to climb. But I will at the same time say, and I think this is where we need to go, that if we're going to take civil rights, if we're going to take someone's rights and to give them a surrogate decision maker, we only do that when we have resources that are dedicated up front to engage with them and to help them in their first road, to, in their first step to recovery. Now, what that means in the Department of Mental Health right now, which we're piloting, and these are a lot of conversations with the governor, is to say that a, conserva a, 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 a conservatee and a conservator, right, that dyad must have access to 24-7 full service partnership. That's a term that really means a, a, a full team. Housing and access to a treatment bed. And that when you have that array, then when you take someone's civil liberties, you're investing in their recovery, and the goal is to actually get them off of conservatorship by giving them the resources that they're desperately needed. And that is an argument that I think appeals to the autonomous, to the paternalists. I think it's fully humane. It will require a tremendous amount of will and funding from the state. This department is all in, and that's not an issue. It'll also require that the federal government, at least for a period of time, waive the IMD exclusion, which doesn't allow us to have funding for all of these treatment beds. So I'm going to leave it there. Well, I, but, I, but I do want to say that um, one question that came up in the cards is, so are you advocating the return of the state hospital? I think you can hear from what John's saying that that's not what is being advocated, but it's a continuum, um, a, a social system. Is that not right, John, which will then uh, it make for a person to have a humane pathway. A absolutely. I mean, as I had said in my opening remarks, it's all about building cohesive communities that have enough not only treatment and prevention-oriented efforts, but people, place, and purpose. You need to have people that support you. You need places to live, and you need purpose in life. And as we build that up JFK-style, 
more people will remain in community and will stop falling out. And as we build up our housing inventory, sorry, our treatment inventory and the hospital inventory and our ability to respond in real time to health and human service needs with health, health and human service resources instead of law enforcement that will create a perimeter around our community so that when people fall out, they get care and they get brought back into the community without languishing in the open air asylum of the streets and the closed asylum of the jails. So the, the IMD exclusion is extremely interesting, John just mentioned in passing. It means that federal money cannot uh, uh, reimburse uh, a hospital that has more than 16 beds, which is incredible because as we speak, there are 1,500 beds of people in, in Twin Towers Jail and uh, for people who have a mental illness, only for people with mental illness. So it, the absurdity of the system, in, our, in the film actually we have Gavin Newsom actually speak and he says we're past the point of uh, you know, this being insanity, this is comedic absurdity. So the absurdity is so clear in things like the IMD exclusion that Dr. Sharon's trying to you know, win over. I think Dr. McGee put it rather well when she said that the definition of uh, insanity is that you do the same thing over and over again expecting different results. That's what we've been doing for 50 years, yes. Another question here is, um, uh, but before we move on, what about other comments in that, in pertaining to that particular issue? Because I think that is the focus of several questions here, which I, I won't then repeat. Other questions from the, other thoughts from the panelists that about, or have we covered it? Well, I, I hate to keep talking, but um, I obviously spend all my time dealing with these issues, and um, including doing my own clinical work in the streets. Um, but the thing I, that I think people need to understand about involuntary treatment is that w the system we have right now is relatively responsive to what we would call imminent or acute danger. So if someone's dangerous to themselves or they're dangerous to, uh, to somebody else, we have a system that is, is, is relatively responsive and it's applied with some uniformity um, you know, here and across the state. But it's the chronic or grave setting of Right, and, and so instead of grave danger, which would mean kind of grave danger to self or grave danger to other, and that's a, something that's not easy to define, but you should think about that. We've used this thing called grave disability, which is very, very hard to define. The courts interpret it very, very differently depending on where you go. And we don't have a system with the resources up front so that when somebody does get conserved, that they're able to get the treatment and our hospital network, which is way, way undersized, is unwilling to house people who need conservatorship because they don't, they're unable to draw down money and they lose money and hospitals go out of business. So I just, I'm just, those are little technical pieces that I think are really, really important as we move forward. So, um, one of the extensions of that, which people ask, you know, what is the cause? So one person says, for example, well, what about the foster care system? Do we, does that actually, in its collapse, uh, one at the age of 18, does that feed into the mental health system? A very interesting issue. Uh, I don't know whether anybody would like to take that on. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this is core safety net material. Right. You know, we have uh, 38,000 kids, families, in, uh, kids in the child welfare system, and about 18,000 that actually are in the foster care system, which, um, for me, and this is a little bit of a controversial statement, for those kids who are kind of not living stably, are kind of akin to the homeless population and the adults. And they funnel into probation into juvenile probation which is a lockup so we are in the process of investing a tremendous amount of mental health resources and bringing other departments together to apply a much different model to the child welfare system and to probation recognizing that we have to identify people's needs and recognize that actually for the vast majority that, 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 that the binding feature is an experience of trauma. And trauma is really horrible for every organ system, including your brain, and is a major risk factor for developing any kind of mental illness, including straight up post-traumatic stress. 
So it's a big problem. The, the, the numbers are remarkable. The number of kids who are in child welfare that end up in probation, it, it's something like 80% of the kids who are in probation have a child welfare experience. And yes, they're feeding the streets. And yes, they're feeding uh, the adult criminal justice system. Any other comments? Uh, as a child psychiatrist, I couldn't agree more with John's comments. And you know, I think part of the problem is is that we have chosen incarceration as opposed to treatment through every spectrum of the population, from teens to to middle adulthood to older adults, and we have not parsed out substance abuse and the comorbidity of substance use with chronic mental illness and adequately allocated resources accordingly. And so this is the first time I, I kind of grew up in LA. My father was a clinical psychologist in the Department of Mental Health, so I grew up with all the stories and what John and others at the County Board of Supervisors are doing now is, is a true paradigm shift um, in the way that we, we look at mental illness. So um, I, I think it's very complicated you cannot incarcerate an 11, 12, or 13-year-old child who's being abused in the environment they come from because they end up on the street and they commit a crime. It's not going to solve a problem, getting back to LaShore's definition of insanity. You cannot incarcerate uh, a chronic homeless schizophrenic man who breaks a window and causes more than $400 of damage and think that you're going to solve the long-term problem in society. So. Substance use and incarceration, I think, are at the, at the core of, of one of the problems with, with some of these youth in DCFS and the adults in general. We were actually there the day the supervisors had that vote, and we filmed it, and that's actually going to be part of the film. Because I think it really is, you know, as, as I said, Claire said, my daughter said, you got to come here because this is the epicenter of the crisis. It is actually, in some ways, becoming the epicenter of change and hope, as well. And um, we ha we actually will incorporate that in the, in the final film that will be on PBS in in 2020. So, would okay? Would you should you do you think we are becoming the epicenter of hope? <laughs> in your in your daily work. Be honest. It's, re it's really hard to feel that way when you're when you're working on the front lines. Um, I can tell you that. I mean, I'm still in the ER. I just switched to a different psych ER, a different county psych ER, um, and I've been working in the psych ER since 2004, and um, you see the beds be becoming fewer and fewer, and our volume, our patient volume is going through the roof. Uh, we, we don't have enough staff to keep up with it. Um, you know, you've, sometimes you have to put patients on the floor and in the hallways. Um, I, I hear and I am aware that change is happening, but we don't see it or feel it quite yet to be honest. I think one of the things that is happening though is there's a conversation now. And I think that um, you know, when we showed this film at Sundance, we were very complimented to be there. And they said, this is the first film we've ever had about mental illness. I was very complimented, but also quite outraged. Because you know, the cost burden of mental illness exceeds that of cancer, cardiac disease, all non-communicable diseases combined. So. Um, but I think now we're having a conversation. That's why I think that vote was so amazing at the Board of Supervisors. I'm not a politician, I'm a sociologist, I'm a clinical psychiatrist in Manhattan. What do I know if they should build a jail or not? But I know that was, that was really amazing there, is that there was a dialogue. And that was a dialogue that I, you know, I haven't seen. And it was sort of like the demonstration that we saw with, you know, whether or not you agree that Patrice should block traffic and put cots in front of the supervisor's office. The, the, it's it's kind of a change. It's a, it, I think we're at a kind of a watershed moment, and in that regard, I see there you know being tremendous hope. Yeah, I, you know I I I share your frustration. 
um, and I think everyone does. But I, but I will tell you, and there is someone here, I think, I can't see because it's a little bit bright, but Greg Polk, are you here, Greg? Yeah, there's Greg. Um, Greg, Greg is, uh, he, he does operations for the department and um, is the person that's really driving the, the reorganization of the department and our ability to deliver. You know, we're in the process now of putting more urgent cares around the county. Urgent cares are really emergency departments that are, s that, that are uh, staffed up for people who um, are having crises to, in, in many ways, mitigate the need to go to the emergency department and into a hospital. We're uh, building 240 crisis residential beds, which are going to be distributed around our health campuses, and that that will be done within a couple of years. And like I was, I think I mentioned it. I get confused. I've been at it a long time today, but that we're we are basically asking the board permission, authority to expand the number of mental health beds in the county. And we are we have literally pounded the pavement, the two of us, to find hospitals. Um, uh, you know that, that that are interested in converting some of their units um, for acute beds, but even more subacute beds, and also um, identifying um, facilities, hospitals that are dormant and that are willing to kind of get into the business because we have to in, we have to invest in care if we're not going to be in, with, with the money that we're taking out of custody. And because where we invest, the people will rest. Um, and I just, I just bring that up because you're, f I mean, I, I, I've been, I haven't been here three years yet in this department. We've done a lot of things, and there's, there are big things that are, that, are, that are lining up within the next year, two, three years, and it's super frustrating. But um, I do believe that the resource array around Los Angeles County is going to change, and people are going to feel it. The first people that are going to feel it are the people that are doing their frontline work in the streets, the police, the fire department, and then we'll start to see less people going into the jails. We'll start to see less people in the emergency departments. Um, let me just extend that a little bit by um, going back in history, because some of the questions per are pertinent to you know how could this have happened, and um, Philippe, I wonder if you have just a very quick. Uh, historical lesson for us, uh, because, for example, when they closed the mental health institutions, was that was that driven by, as is implied in the film, by the, sh the, the essentially the switching of the economic burden, or was it also really tied to the idea that we could uh, help people in the community? Was that what was the reality there? Because, as some people here ask, was it? Was it coerced by the American Civil Liberties Union in the sense that everybody should have their own freedom to decide whether they get treatment or not? You'll remember that was a big thing. Or was it, in fact, more politically motivated? Uh, well, it, it, it's, uh, from, from my understanding of it, it, it was really the th um, s uh, three, at least three, but more factors that came together all of a sudden. One was um, an improvement in medications that was happening that gave uh, an excessive hope that they would be magic bullets that would take care of the problem. Um, and, uh, and then coincidental with that was, uh, was the civil rights movement, a, uh, a, a, a civil rights recognition of, of civil rights for people with serious mental illness. And, um, and then there was also the beginning of what we now call neoliberalism, uh, the, the destruction of the social welfare network and the cutting of federal funds uh, and state funds, and then these manipulations of changing the rules for how s uh, IMDs are funded, Medicaid, and, and so forth, which was just a travesty of shifting of funds. So you had people, you had different interest groups with very different, with 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 often diametrically opposed visions. Um, that came together and resulted in, in this n outcome that no one wanted, and, and a really uh, um, a, an, an unintended tragic consequence in some sense. I mean, some uh, one member of the audience said, well, you know, isn't it true that one of the problems which we find here on the streets is that because people do not understand their medications and it make the, they make them feel like shit, to, to quote the uh, question, um, <laughs> Uh, that's why they turn to street drugs. And again, it seems to me that that 
uh, naively, it seems to me that that is also put in place uh, in, in the social place, because if one doesn't have the sort of support systems that have been talked about here, that's why, to some degree, this happens. Yes, psychiatric drugs are not uh, perfect, but they are capable of bringing somebody back to rationality and then helping them think through what it is that they might prefer to do, as you saw in the film, in terms of uh, um, the gentleman who was first introduced, the, Dr. McGee's patient. But um, I think those, those are the sorts of social questions that we have, and th the problem is that we have to be careful not to just place it back upon the patient, well, they don't take their meds, and that's why all this sort of stuff happens. Um, other questions, but s let me just let you freewheel a moment, and uh, who would like to make some point on where we are from where we've come from? I mean, in, in this evening, not from not in the grand universe. <laughs> <laughs> how do you th how do you think your film is going to be is going to be met in this regard? Oh, that's I mean, a great here question. Here we are talking in a talking in a very we're talking in a bubble here. I mean, most you know, people I, I, most I, people here believe that yeah. we can make a change. But what is what do you think the impact is going to be nationally? Well, I, I I mean, I don't know. I w you know, we've had very very good responses. Um, just a couple of days ago, I was uh, I, I got an invitation to give a presidential symposium at the American Psychiatric Association, which they said talk about whatever you want. I was like, really, this is unbelievable, and they were very responsive to the film. And I thought because the film is even the clip you saw is rather critical of psychiatry, I thought that they were the psychiatrists are going to be very very angry. But what really happened is, that especially the young psychiatrists stood up and started talking about um, and asking the president of the American Psychiatric Association who sponsored this and who was with me, uh, teach us how to change the system. So really, I think what we're really seeing, that's why I really, you know, I'm not such a positive guy as you could tell from the film, right? <laughs> but I think that we really are at a threshold, at a watershed moment because we're having a conversation and I, don't, I, I think because people like me are talking about their families, and I think that people like Lashar are, uh, you know, talking about, uh, Lashar actually talks about her family and, and, and works and, and works in an emergency room. I think there's a conversation going, and I think that is the real hope now. So I think the, our film is coming out at a time when that conversation is, is really about to happen. So you see social change in the in the, in the I do. The I mean, I think that you know when we people are we're, we're talking about IMD, so we're talking about assisted outpatient treatment, we're talking about mental health courts. This film is an advertisement for mental health courts. Right. You know, we see Monty goes to a mental health court and gets treatment and succeeds, and Todd is shoved down the street. And uh, you know, the last time I saw him was uh, living at an SRO. His his counselor Steve Mitchell is uh, in the film is somewhere here. Steve, where? There, there he is. He's the brave guy who found <laughs> Todd an apartment. <laughs> and still tries to find Todd a new apartment. Yeah, that's wonderful. Colin, you had a question. I think you were going to say something. Yeah, just a brief comment. I, I think what we need to do individually and again as a society is to begin to destigmatize mental illness. Mental illness has long been looked at as a, you know, not as a traditional illness that, that we can identify, diagnose, and find treatment for. It's been looked at as an illness of the individual that they can overcome on their own. And people don't want to talk about mental illness within their own families, within themselves. So how do we begin a discussion as a society if it's difficult to begin that discussion with within yourself, within your own family, amongst your own circle of friends. And so I, I think that as this society looks at mental illness as a valid entity that's beyond the control of the individual, it will start to sort of legitimize itself, if you will, in the context of federal funding, state funding, local funding, the way the police officer approaches a mentally ill person on the streets of Los Angeles. Well, here's an interesting one take the fact that most people who are living on the streets have created their own home. It says, the, the question is pejorative in a sense, it says, don't homeless people already have a home? It's terrible. 
but it is their home. They have their things there. How does one change that? And I've certainly known the situation where individuals who've lived on the streets for a decade or two, they don't want to take themselves immediately into a house. I see heads nodding. Probably, Dr. McGee, you've seen that. What, what is your take on that? I mean, uh, people who walk into the hospital with their shopping cart, which is all their possessions, they want to take that into the home that they have, yes? So uh, I would say that there's a, a percentage of, of, of people with mental illness, specifically those with schizophrenia, um, who I think that's probably the biggest population that I struggle with convincing to get them off of the streets. But I would say that um, it's, it's a function of the illness. So, t so when someone is incredibly paranoid, um, has sort of retreated inward, as, as some people do with schizophrenia, and, and do not want to be around people, uh, or institutions, um, you, you can't really have the discussion about housing. You have to get them better and get them thinking in a different frame of mind before you can have the conversation about housing. So um, they're inextricably tied, treatment and housing. You can't really have one without the other. And um, frequently what happens is if you can place someone in housing, but they are not getting simultaneous treatment uh, or participating in the treatment, uh, they quickly slide back and they, yeah. they yeah. you know, disasters happen in those housing settings because that's, they, they, they end up in the emergency room. Those are mm -hmm. quite frequently uh, some of the people that we get. Um, so it, it's, I hear, I hear a lot about housing, and, and housing first is extremely important, but there are people who can't participate in that process for whom housing first does not work. So Ken and, Ken and uh, um, John, how, what does one say to that? I mean, wh what are we trying to do to, you know, human beings are creatures of habit, yes? I mean, I. Some of you have heard me lecture about some of these things. If, you, if I got you to cross your arms right now, you'd all do it in your habitual way, and then I ask you to do it the other way. It's very difficult, yes? Well, that might be extrapolated out to what, if you've been living on the streets for 10 years and you're living out of your shopping cart, it's a little difficult to change. So how does one help that process? How does one change those habits, which then enable us to become more humane as a society, John or or, or Ken or, well, or anybody. I mean, you know, th th this is another one. Yeah, this is a Philippe question, but I, I, you know, I think one of the powers of the film is that there is a fair amount of, through the lens of, uh, you know, of, of people going through their own challenges and suffering, and I, I think it's very hard to know why someone would agree or not agree to accept housing. But I, I and I, I do think your point about being creatures of habit is is relevant. But what I can say is that you know we we have this sense that we always know what is right, and we don't listen to people. Um, and when we meet people because they ask for something or they tell us something that is an opportunity to engage, we need to engage on that. And we as a field have said oh, well, you have to engage and you have to be sober, you have to get treatment, you have to do all this programming or you can't be, yeah. you can't get the housing. Right. So, like, who are we taking care of? Exactly. Right, but, and then what I would say is that the, the, the sense of belonging, and I talk a lot about purpose, is really, really critical. And if you have uh, affiliations and, and, you know, relations, uh, you know, in a setting like Skid Row or somewhere else and, it's, it, and, and you're, you belong there and you're tied to that, to that group, like why would you, why, you know, getting plucked out of there and stuck into, uh, you know, um, some type of uh, mixed housing, uh, you know, that, that, that's well intended and, and does work for some people is not necessarily a solution. So we have to think about that. We have to think very broadly about what is it that people, people want and need and are motivated to accept as 
they defined their road to recovery, which is what other uh, places in the planet that have done this much better than us uh, do. And Trieste, Italy is one of them. We're, having, we have, we're, we're in the process of getting, putting, putting together a pilot in Hollywood that really is focused on that. And the key to doing anything like that is payment reform. You know, the way that we get paid to do our work is to, it, it involves kind of taking care of medical charts and auditors, not people. And what we're asking for is to say, give us the resources and let us apply the resources to the human needs and audit us on the outcomes of the individual and the population. And, and just uh, jumping off on that, uh, there's, there's so many lessons that we can learn straightforwardly from just about every other uh, industrialized nation. And it's simply that you can't let the free market take care um, so savagely of housing. And you can even look across the United States. You simply don't have all these people who we see as wanting to be homeless here when in, other, in other cities. Because as soon as you have cheap, uh, you know, uh, cheap and available and accessible housing, people fill it. And, and what we have in Los Angeles is this extraordinary rise in property values that simultaneously has thrown so many people into the streets and, and then has them end up in, in, in county jail. And we have a political system and a set of real estate interests that simply aren't allowing us to, to, to create affordable housing, to even have a, a semblance of rent stabilization. Yes, unfortunately, uh, here... We have, I remember visiting a friend in Germany some years ago now, and I was talking about uh, there were lots of people on the streets, and uh, he said um, he had been here to Los Angeles. He said, you know, the only difference between these people here is most of these are musicians, whereas in, 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 in Los Angeles it's not quite so sanguine. But, uh, but let me, that brings up two more points. We are going to have to, we will finish at 9 o'clock. That's um, the the bewitching hour, but um, I think these late last comments, I know that y many of you have experience in street medicine. Yes, I know John has, I know you have Philippe, um, and probably others, but uh, how does that fit in the, when, when one becomes a street doctor, which means basically you go to the patient, not have wait for the jailer to bring the patient to you, how does that work and fit into what we've been discussing here? Uh, well, this one's fresh in my mind. I actually started my day at 6.30 in Hollywood doing uh, street psychiatry, and, and I really see it as a... I see it as an engagement tool. Um, and, you know, I was meeting with someone who's very, very sick, and I've seen him over the past few weeks, and um, I brought him medications, the one medication that he was that he was willing to take, that he's taken, and he's responded to well. Um, and, I, and, and my goal was to kind of, uh, first of all, let him know that, um, you know, that, uh, that there are people that care um, and encourage him to, you know, uh, reconnect with um, the clinicians. Um, but one of the things that happens that I think has been referenced here is that particularly for someone with a chronic psychotic disorder who can begin taking even small doses of an antipsychotic, it will kind of reorient their, uh, their, their, their understanding of where they are and why they are there. And that can provoke engagement and also interest in accessing other resources. But, you know, I can't leave here without just talking about the collective. You know, the government's not going to solve these problems. These are collective problems. We need collective solutions. Um, one of the biggest problems that we have, and it's not just for housing, but it's a big, big deal for housing, is that no one wants people housed near them. Okay? Uh, guess what? You know, we're never going to have inclusion and in real community unless we figure out how to kind of stay connected and take care of each other. You know, and I mean, I talked to the supervisors about, you know, a YIMBY anti-tax and a NIMBY tax. So in other words, if you want to invite people in, then we ought to give you a tax break. And if you don't want people because you don't want them near you, then you ought to pay for it, big time. Uh, well, this, this is the, one of the differences between our own social sense here in the U.S., where we're very individualistic. I can tell you, i give you an hour's lecture on that one, di one time. But, um, but I think that is, that is uh, an important element. 
However, we are beginning to build housing, is that not correct, in the city? And I think we're beginning to make some inroads into the idea that, uh, that what John is saying is correct, that if you habituate somebody to a home and you enable them to have good medical care within that home, they're going to stay there. They're not going to go back to their street cart down in the center of the city. And I'll just add, but the, related to the issue before, you know, people have asignosia. You know, part of often what happens with people with a serious mental illness, yeah. they all know that they're sick. So we have a, and that gets into the whole civil liberties versus autonomy issue, which is a very, very difficult issue to deal with. And I think it's, you know, part of the picture. Um, and it is, in a way, I think does, you know, if you could find therapeutic jurisprudence, which is, again, what we saw in the film, where you have a judge who's compassionate, understands, has limited resources, right? That's why Monty stays in jail waiting for a bed. But at least he gets treatment. At least he's diverted from jail and diverted from being criminalized, as we've done, to being, you know, to, to having a life. That was one question, actually. Why did Monty stay in, in jail for three months? Because, because he had a history that it made it very unfavorable for a treatment facility to say, come on, we want you. And because one of the problems, uh, Dr. Sharon explains better than anyone, is when you have a system, I mean, you need judges that are trained in mental health courts and assisted outpatient treatment, which is not a, you know, and not a thing that's something that's happening or has been happening in Los Angeles, but is hopefully happening increasingly. But then you need the resources, the places to put them. So they could say, you know, thank God the judge said, we don't need you to go to prison, we need you to go to treatment. But then you have to find a treatment facility for them, and that's part of the mandate of DMH to find those resources so they're not languishing in jail. But it's a lot better than languishing and dying on the streets. So we're coming to the end. One of the questions was, uh, what do we do here at the university for uh, the persons who are uh, underprivileged and, and poor and homeless? And the answer is not as much as we should. But of the whole medical center, we have about 16% within the uh, psychiatry facilities outpatient and inpatient services uh, of, uh, of our patients are, um, in, are in poor economic circumstances or actually um, are uh, Medicare and uh, M Medicaid, excuse me. One of the things that John and I have been working on is to increase that around the state and also around the county. We've had various um, discussions with the, the legislature and we're moving on that on that uh, uh, effort because I think a state university and a state institution uh, which is uh, funded through the state to take care of the mentally ill, we need to be in greater union and that's one of the great advantages of having Philippe here, of having uh, John here, of having uh, hospitals. Uh, the Olive View Hospital is a UCLA hospital funded by the county. I mean, the, the whole thing is beginning to gel and come together. It's like the raindrops on the, on the window. You know, eventually they start, they start individually, but they, they eventually coalesce into something which I think is a genuine social movement. And I think that's what you've begun to hear about this evening. And I want to thank all our participants who've done an extraordinary job of bringing this to a reality. I particularly want to thank... I particularly want to thank Ken for his visionary film and the fact that he, uh, from his own personal pain, recognized that uh, this is something that needs a social movement. And I think, Ken, you just might have tri triggered that off. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank all of our panelists. Um, you are all so dedicated to improving the lives of people with mental illness and improving our community and our culture. And thank you so much for the work you do and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us this evening. Uh, we are very grateful to you all. And thank you all for coming. We hope to see you at future Open Mind programs.